Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Isotopic Chats. Today is June 30th, 2022. We're talking about MOUs, which is an acronym for Memorandums. Memorandum? Memorandum of Understanding. This fits plural. Is it Memorandums? Memorandums? No, I can't even say it. We're just going to call it MOUs. And um, as I was thinking about putting this presentation together, I thought, why do we need a whole presentation on MOUs? It's just something we house within contracts, right? So one of those things. But I realize this is like a five, 10 minute conversation. And uh, we usually kind of lop it on to the end of the, the conversation about contracts. But we always end up spending more and more time talking about it. And somebody at some point uh, wrote me a note saying, we should do one on MOUs. And I thought, is there enough on there? I, I think there is. And so well, we'll see where this goes today. Um, anyway, the, the long and the short of it is, we're going to talk about MOUs, which are a, a, a sort of a contract, but not, not uh, legally binding. But let's take a, a quick disclaimer here. I just want to point out I am not a lawyer. Whatever I tell you today, don't uh, don't hold against me <laughs> because I this is what I've learned over the time through my research, through my own experiences. I, most of what I've done has never been tested in court, um, and my MOUs have not that I'm going to share with you have not been reviewed by a lawyer. So I um, just want to point that out that I don't, when it, when it all comes down to it, I really don't care what I'm talking about. Hopefully I know a little bit, but not enough to be uh, held up in court. So just, just say that. Okay, so background, let's talk about a contract. We're talking about a legally binding document that recognizes and governs those rights and duties of parties you outline, who's going to do what and how cash will be, how services will be rendered, cash, maybe there's materials involved as well. Um, the key phrase here is legally binding. It's a, uh, it's a document that if, we, if push comes to shove and somebody needs to get out of it or if somebody is wrong, you can go to this document that helps dictate what should happen. And it can be interpreted by some lawyers you'd settle out of court or hypothetically go to court and a judge would and, and, and others perhaps to get involved and help you understand what, um, who owes what to whom, um, who owes, anyway, that's very important. Um, the MOU is not a contract. It is, um, and this is a, a definition I got this morning from Investopedia. And MOU or a memorandum of understanding is an agreement between two or more parties. Um, it's formal, usually it's signed, but it is not legally binding. Let's see what it is. Not legally binding, but it signals willingness for parties to move forward with the contract. And that's an interesting part of the part of this, their definition, which I don't always, I don't always think about. Um, I sometimes use an MOU in place of a contract because I don't quite get we're not going to get there. And I can get there with wherever we're at with this piece of a project. Or um, if we're talking about a five year project or something like that, something over a period of time, significant, significant amount of money, I'm going to have a contract. But if we're dealing with something that needs to happen quickly, um, time wise, or it's um, I, or there's no money being exchanged, I'll use an MOU. And I'm going to go into some more of that in a second. Um, I found this next little video interesting. So let's see if this works. I'm going to try clicking this and hypothetically, um, you should be able to hear this. I might need to stop sharing. Let's stop sharing and make sure my windows open. We stop sharing and start sharing again. Share sound. Not much for a video. Okay. Let's do that again. So we are popping up, and this is what Investopedia has to say about this. So we're gonna try try and see if this works. Um, if if this starts playing and nobody hears it, start shaking your hands at me or do something so I know. Oh, <laughs> guess what? We're gonna have an ad. Isn't that great? If you're always asking, where next? Capital One yeah, has Capital the One. travel card for you. Venture X. 
Earn 10x miles on hotels and 5x miles on flights booked through Capital One Travel. Now I can't Venture X, what's sure in your wallet? That's because it's an ad or not. Okay, I'm not hearing that. Let's see if we can get some volume going with that. And if this doesn't work, we'll just skip it because I'm restating a lot of what they're saying here anyway. Uh, but this, this is a video that, I feel like you have too many controls running. A memorandum of understanding or an- All right, let's just skip it. Um, there's a bit, uh, I'll, I'll put this link in the, in the chat for everybody. That, that was working, Matt. Did you hear it? Yeah, we yeah. heard it. I didn't hear it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start it up again. <laughs> if you guys can hear it, that sounds awesome. Um, that's amazing. I didn't, I, it's not coming through on my end for some reason. A memorandum of understanding, or an MOU, is a written legal agreement. An MOU frequently kickstarts an official agreement providing the first step in the creation of a formal contract. It details all terms, requirements, and responsibilities the parties plan to meet. While an MOU is not as formal as a signed contract, and therefore not legally binding, it's more formal than a handshake and carries weight in court if someone fails to live up to its terms. Like a letter of intent, an MOU expresses the intent of two sides in a negotiation. For example, an MOU could be used in a real estate deal to list the conditions of the sale. Say a buyer wants to pay for a house in full, but won't have the funds for a year. An MOU might state that the buyer will make a small down payment for now, and in a year will pay the balance. The seller could add that she has the right to refund the buyer's money and sell to someone else if the buyer doesn't pay the balance within the specified time period. When the sale actually does take place, a legal document will be required to close the deal. MOUs typically need to identify all parties involved, outline the terms of the agreement, and be signed by all involved. Okay, um, I didn't hear that, but I could read it for some reason. My uh, transcription software picked it up, but um, so I knew it was happening. Oh man, when you think you know everything about Zoom, you find another level of things that don't make any sense to you, and you're, and you're still dealing with more errors. But anyway, the long, the long and the short of it, I thought that was the 90 seconds you need. Frankly, we could, we could skip the rest of this, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how I use MOUs, some of the things that I. My, my reflection on it and how I think it makes sense for us as evaluators. So what I heard there was there's a handshake. This is a more formal version of a handshake. It's not legally binding and it's something that may be on the way to a contract, which is what the way I use it for the most part, or I use it in place of a contract, a very small amount of risk to me or something that uh, needs to happen quickly. Um, before we get to a formal contract. A couple of the things that I, I see with this, this is the MOUs get the ball rolling with my clients. Um, I see that many project directors may need some, need some, need some um, momentum to get things rolling. They don't know what to do with this, I found. Um, they're unsure how to proceed with evaluators. In fact, I had a meeting just last week with a potential client from a, a large institution. This was her first time writing an NSF project. And she, she quite frankly turned to me, she says, what do we talk about? What are we supposed to talk about? I know I need an evaluator. What am I supposed to know? And so I kind of had to coach her through how to, to recruit an evaluator. Interestingly, she chose somebody else. So uh, apparently I talked myself out of a, a project with her. I thought that was interesting. The next step I would have taken with her, if she says, yeah, I would love for you to write an evaluation plan to, to submit with our NSF proposal, I would put together an MOU with her outlining what happens. And um, that's how I use it for the most part. Signals my intent to work with them, gets the ball rolling with the connection between me and a client. 
before we get to that point where there's actual money and projects involved. Um, just like a contract, it communicates expectations. Um, it, it outlines what I'm going to do, what I expect of somebody else. Um, it, if there's any money involved, um, it outlines that. And oftentimes it's all, you know, they generally are going to pay with it, pay what they say they're going to pay in an MOU, even though it's not a contract, it's not legally binding, but it, it gets, gets things flowing. And again, I, if it's a big dollar amount, I'm going to use a contract to make sure that happens. But if it's a small dollar amount and I need to get this moving quickly, I will use an MOU. Um, but communicating the expectations, some of that money may even be the fact that I'm going to do a pro bono project. Um, pro bono, in this instance, is one where I'm doing a project so that I can create an opportunity for a future project. And so I use the MOU in place of that. There's not really anything at this except for time. Um, and you know, time is an expense, of course, but uh, the time, I'm, that's, that's not as much of a risk to me because I'm gonna spend my time doing program development anyway. This communicates what's happening with that program development. And the pro bono piece, I often will say, well, if I were charging you for this um, evaluation design development, it would cost $1,000, $5,000, or whatever the amount might be. It communicates to them there's value in the work that I'm doing too. Um, and then, because I work with universities, I we realize there's a lot of bureaucracy. So many of my, my project directors or potential project directors who are writing um, grants can't sign contracts. And the idea of signing a contract just freezes the moment. It, everything stops. And what you're looking at here is a, a giant hairball. This is a reference to orbiting the giant hairball above um, that. This is another graphic that I like. And it's written by Gordon McKenzie. Um, he was a, a he was on with Hallmark for uh, years, and he was, he kind of grew up through the their bureaucracy, and he realized it was this hairball of activity, and people couldn't get anything done because there was just too many rules, regulations, policies, ways that you had to route a form through. And he was responsible for a creative department of people who wrote well Hallmark cards and. Those Hallmark card people didn't need to get involved with the bureaucracy. So he became that protector, that wall between them. And so he, he talks about, I'm getting off on a whole different topic here, but he talks about how you need to orbit around this planet. Effectively, uh, Hallmark became this mass. They had mass of, bure of bureaucracy, um, which he referred to as a hairball. And the only way to get things done is to stay out of that hairball and orbit around it. But with, with this, this is a way that your clients or potential clients can orbit the hairball of their bureaucracy. They can create an MOU, which doesn't legally bind anything, but it, 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 it indicates um, expectations between you and your client or potential future client on what's gonna happen. And the reason I'm particularly concerned about doing this is because I've had this happens with new, um, new potential project directors who are writing their first NSF grants. They don't know what they're doing, just like the person I was talking about last week. <clears throat> they don't know what they're doing with, with an evaluator, and then they just start talking to different people. And so what happened to me years ago is an individual expressed interest in my evaluation plan, and I took about a day to put one together, and I sent it to him, and he goes, oh, I'm sorry. I decided to go with somebody else. And I went back and I looked through my emails and I'm like, what part of these emails did it seem like you didn't want me to write this evaluation plan to support to this? And it's because I didn't go to the trouble of formalizing an agreement. But again, he couldn't have had a contract signed with his university for this. It was, it wasn't, we weren't at that level of importance. He couldn't really sign that, but he could have signed off on an MOU. So that's really where I started using this plan. Um, so the key components to an MOU, you want to make sure you're identifying those parties involved, obviously yourself and that organization or institution you're working with. You want to give a description of what you're doing. So if we're talking about writing a grant together, the project description was, well, you're writing a grant to the National Science Foundation for uh, um, 
undergraduate studies and education or whatever division you're working with. You outline the scope of what you're doing for them. Um, you outline your roles and responsibilities and their roles and responsibilities. One of those roles and responsibilities for an MOU used for a pro bono grant evaluation project will be you're going to list me in your proposal. And when the proposal is funded, you will contract with me to do this evaluation. And pretty much they're saying this already. You're just putting it in paper, you're putting it down on paper and they're signing it. Um, and then if there's any costs involved, um, if there is any money being exchanged, um, this does serve as a pseudo contract. Um, hypothetically, you could actually call it a contract, I suppose. Um, but it, 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 if there's any costs, Again, the question mark is put there because in many ways, if you're going to have costs, you might want to take that next step if it's significant and get a contract signed. Again, I said some different uses for a pro bono, I'm sorry, an MOU is for pro bono projects or very quick turnaround projects with the university or a large bureaucracy. And here's another example of something. I literally, right before this, this uh, began, I submitted an invoice to uh, a large university um, two weeks ago, they, they turned to me and said, hey, our project was um, greenlit, uh, and the first period of performance is um, June 8th, and this was June 15th, by the way, June 8th through June 30th, and you have $25,000. I'm like, well, how am I going to get a, a contract signed with this large university, state institution, in two weeks, in less than two weeks, because we didn't even have two weeks to work on it. Um, and they're like, well, we're not. <laughs> and I said, well, how am I going to get paid? And they said, well, send us an invoice. And I'm like, so you're going to pay the invoice, but you don't have any agreement. So I, I put together an MOU effectively in email and made sure they responded to it. We didn't get to the point of signature on it. Um, and, and I submitted the invoice just now, right before this meeting started. And uh, well, I'll, I'll update you on whether it worked. They promised me to pay the invoice, but promises with large organizations don't always go very far unless you got something to stand on. So we'll see where it goes. Um, and if it and if push comes to shove, at least I created my MOU to say, listen, they said they would do this. This is what they said. I outlined it in this document. So it's another way of just creating all those things. So with that, we are, um, I don't have a lot more to say. It's 11.23, my time. Um, I want to point out some more sessions that are coming up. Next week, we're going to have our 100th isotopic check. And um, we will have uh, a discussion on resilience, and it's going to be a panel topic with Susan, Ian, and Kurt. Um, I put out a survey to uh, all of our previous presenters, and several of whom responded back with just ideas on resilience. And so we'll reflect on some of those ideas and kind of discuss it and see where that goes. If nothing else, we'll sit and chat about all the things that we do. They're all independent consulting and answering questions from anybody who's just dealing with something. I moved the core topic up to June, July 14th, um, and that will that will be on insurance. Those core topics are those topics that I think everybody should know about. And, uh, who's running an independent consulting practice? It's the sort of thing we cover in um, pre-conference workshops, either the intro or the immediate workshops. And uh, I think it's we all we and we're we repeat each one of those once a year. So our July core topic is on insurance. And then we're going to revisit the side hustle, the idea of not being a, a full-time independent consulting practice or a, or a multi-person firm, but just doing the work while you got a, a doing a, a, a full-time job in this independent consulting idea is the side hustle. So we'll do that on July 21st. And from there, we'll figure some more things out. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll go into the, the portion of asking and answering questions. All right.